The Killers are one of the biggest bands in the world today. Formed in Las Vegas in 2002, the group, singer Brandon Flowers, guitarist Dave Kooning, bassist Mark Stormer, and drummer Ronnie Vanucci, have enjoyed a meteoric rise to fame. Their distinctive sound and style has won the millions of fans and seen their first two albums go multi-platinum across the globe. We've interviewed friends, former band members, and music industry professionals to uncover the band's history, where they got their unique sound, what the band members are really like, and how it all began. Although not particularly renowned for producing original music, Nonetheless, Las Vegas, like any major city, has a sizable music scene. The Las Vegas music scene is very diverse. Much of what the tourist sees is considerably different from what it is that actually goes on in this town for locals and stuff like that. But the same way you have a lot of different diversity from the different clubs or casinos or anything else that you'll go into here in town, also is reflective in the bands. We have bands that span all kinds of different genres and subgenres. If you ask 10 different people what Vegas is about, you're going to get 10 different answers, and probably none of them are or accurate, you know, unless people have actually been here for any length of time. The Vegas rock scene is is funny. Whenever I first moved out here in 90, 99, um, there was a lot of really great bands that, I mean, unfortunately aren't even around anymore. And then a year or two, those all those bands kind of broke up or went their own ways and started. And then Vegas hit like a, a real, for lack of a better term, a new metal phase that they went through. And it even some to this day, you know, are still there to an extent. I mean, of course, you know, once once you get a band like The Killers or, you know, Panic! at the Disco or something like that that broke out, then you, of course you're going to get a lot of bands that are starting to, you know, emulate that and try to, you know, copy it and everything. In those early days when I first got started, our local music scene was amazing. We had some, we had The Huntridge, which was great, really supported local bands. We had a bar called The Boston that was awesome at supporting the local bands. And we had a few different places around town where bands could play. They could make some money, support their... Uh, band habits, if you will, and their, their practice room and their instruments and all their gear that they have to keep up on. And it, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And then there was periods of time where the Huntridge closed and then it wasn't so good and Boston changed management and it wasn't so good. And so it's just been this up and down thing. And even when I was a kid, there's this constant struggle of Vegas being the entertainment capital of the world. But if you're under 21, there's really nothing to do. With the younger bands now, you know, we're, we are starting to get a lot more emo scene, but unfortunately there's just not a lot of places for the kids to go here, you know, because being a 21 and over town. With strict local laws banning under-21s from the main tourist strip after 9pm, coupled with the incredible variety of entertainment and distractions available in Las Vegas, it can understandably be difficult for local artists to find an audience. You know, if you went all the way across the United States and interviewed musicians from everywhere, I'm sure every musician is going to say, oh, it's hard to get noticed in our scene, but, you know, to an extent, but, I mean, Come on, you have Vegas. I mean, it's 24-hour drinking. There's, you know, you go to the, the strip and there's nightclub after nightclub after nightclub. How, the, how are you going to convince anybody, you know, that's not your friends and stuff like that to go, hey, why don't you get off the strip and come down to this really dumpy bar and watch my band play? The original music scene is, is pretty underground. There's not that many venues to play at, so it um, makes it difficult. And all the stuff that happens up on the strip. These amazing acts playing all the time, but you know, people don't come to Vegas for culture, so to say, they come to, you know, experience the whole wow factor. Most cities in the United States have a university radio station which is generally promotes things that are happening around the city and the immediate area. So you find out about new bands, they have all of these featured alternative rock things, and they have the local charts as well, so which local bands are doing well and which ones are about to release a CD or a single. Or... Here, our university station is the jazz station. Here, 
you really have to know people that are out there in the scene just to find out where people are playing or rely on word of mouth or some of the local publications do list what's going on but if you're trying to find something new you have no idea what you want to check out or whether this is going to be worth seeing or not. People think of Vegas as the entertainment capital of the world but you come to Vegas and there's, you know, back when I started this there was only a million people here. The only reason why bands would come into town at all is because it was Vegas. We didn't really have the fan base to support the bands that were coming here. That's the other thing, it is Vegas and 24-7, so I mean, if you're playing on a Tuesday night and you're not going on till midnight, chances are a lot of your friends and fans are still have to get up and go to their day jobs, as probably you do too. Here we are, all together. In 2002, native Iowan and guitarist Dave Cooney was living in Vegas and looking to try something different from the local rock-heavy music scene. He searched for musical collaborators for some time before some like-minded musicians spotted his ad in a local music paper, including a young singer-songwriter called Brandon Flowers. I think it was Dave that, as I understand it, put the ad in the paper saying that he was influenced by Oasis U2 and some other bands, The Smiths, and that, you know, piqued Brandon's interest. You know, they have classifieds, man-seeking woman, transvestite seeking, you know, someone like me, looking for a couch. But Dave was looking for, uh, I guess, for me. And so I came knocking on Dave's door. And that's kind of how it all started. I met um, Brandon and Dave through an ad here in town um, through a paper, uh, paper called The City Life. There was an ad looking for a drummer, and they were into bands like The Beatles, Oasis, um, you know, a lot of stuff that was at this time in Vegas, not in, you know, no other bands. I mean, you know, most of the time there was, you know, a lot of bands were still into like Limp Biscuit and Green Day and stuff. And, you know, I was looking for something different. So I called them up and they were normal guys. I went over to Dave's apartment and we sat down and we, uh, they showed me a couple of the stuff they were working on. And one of the songs was Replaceable, which eventually we ended up recording and went on the demo but there was just you know Dave and Brandon at the time. Luckily we didn't have to worry about paying for a rehearsal space we just rehearsed at my house and then whenever I moved in with my my fiance at the time um, whenever we got engaged I moved in with her we practiced in our garage. My neighbors were really cool about it and um, you know no complaints as long as we you know we didn't stay out too late playing you know to keep the neighbors up yeah we so that part was cool we all had house gigs or you know had gigs around town working. The original bass player was Dave's roommate at the time when we went in to record the demo it was just Brandon, Dave, and I. And uh, Dave covered the guitar, the bass, and everything. Excited by the material they were writing, the trio decided to record a demo as The Killers, a name they had taken from a New Order video featuring the perfect band. Once, like, Mr. Brightside and all that stuff was up and done, we went straight into the studio and, and knocked him out. Because, in fact, I remember I had st written down, you know, okay, four measures before I come in here and here, because, I mean, the songs were... You know, that, that, that new, really, I was still, you know, somewhat learning them as, as, as we were recording. I mean, I think we dropped, like, maybe $1,200, if even that. I mean, it was, you know, something like, maybe not even that, you know, but it was, you know, it was like $1,000 or something that we paid for that, for that demo. So that was all money out of our pocket that we, that we used.